Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Managing Anxiety, Make It Work For You. My name is Karen Katusian. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement here at St. Joseph's College. Before we get started, we want to just make sure that you're able to see and hear us clearly at all times and that you're able to engage with our speaker at any point should you choose to do so. Make sure that you can find the chat bubble if you're on your computer. Make sure that you can type in questions if you have any questions throughout the webinar. We're also going to be setting aside some time at the end for questions as well. So if you want to hold off and see if perhaps maybe your question will be answered, you can do that also. Make sure you can hear us clearly. You can dial any of the phone numbers that we gave you on the conference invitation and of course use your conference ID. And without further ado, Managing Anxiety, Making It Work For You with our special guest tonight, Dr. Laura Van Shake Harmon, who graduated from St. Joseph's College in 2006 with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. She received the Doctor of Psychology in 2011 from St. John's University. She is a New York State licensed psychologist, New York State certified school psychologist, as well as a distance credentialed counselor. Dr. Dr. Van Shea Carmen is an active member in the Suffolk County Psychological Association as a member at large and chairperson of the website committee. She is a lecturer at St. Joseph's College where she teaches courses in behavior modification and psychological testing. She was awarded the Suffolk County Psychological Association Service Award in 2012 and its Outstanding Service Award in 2014. Dr. Van Shea Carmen, thank you so much for being here tonight. I know we're very excited to hear you facilitate this topic and we're excited to hear what our audience uh, has to say as for any questions from them as well. Take it away. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here and thank you everyone who's taking the time tonight to be with us. I believe that anxiety is a very important topic for everyone to know about, know its inner workings and how to deal with it since it's a very normal, common human emotion which you're going to be experts on this topic by the time that we're done and really understand that. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, basically in this webinar, my hope is for everybody to leave here with a nice, solid understanding about what anxiety is, what triggers anxiety. You might even notice poten uh, potential triggers in yourself personally, and how to manage it. So the first concept here is I want to normalize it. Anxiety is a normal human emotion, meaning that nobody is immune to it. Everybody is going to get anxious at some point or another in our lives. Sometimes we're more anxious than others, sometimes we're less anxious than others, and sometimes we experience anxiety during times that are sort of unhelpful for us or that we, during times when we really shouldn't be feeling anxiety. But if we're able to manage it and we know why it shows up, when it shows up, and what to do when it shows up, it can be useful, a very useful emotion in order to keep us safe as a species and individually. So the first step here is not freaking out when we feel anxious and knowing that it's just a normal human emotion that we are experiencing in our body. So some symptoms, many of you, if you've ever experienced anxiety or it's popped up in your body, have already experienced some of these symptoms that are listed here. They're not new. So anxiety consists of different clusters. So the first cluster here is physiological symptoms. So this might be the sensation that your heart is beating very, very quickly or a racing heart. Others might experience a sensation of I'm feeling like I could faint or I'm, I'm a little lightheaded or even dizzy. Others might feel this sense of depersonalization where they feel like almost like out of their body, like just feel off, not themselves, almost like they're floating away and they're looking at themselves from the outside, just not, not themselves or even a weakness in our legs. A very common physiological symptom is shortness of breath. So this might be a rapid, a rapid breathing or the sensation of pressure on our chest where we can't get a deep breath in. Fear of acting or going crazy or even losing control is a very common anxiety symptom. And then also temperature changes, so feeling like hot and clammy or even feeling cold. So if you notice, these can go um, that particular symptom can go either way as far as it's just more like an extreme temperature perception difference. And then another cluster is this cognitive or your, your thought pattern, your mental symptoms. So anxiety often shows up, we have our physiological component and we also have our cognitive component. 
And the cognitive component, we might even consider this more commonly known as a worry or being just consistently worried. So people might experience this as a sense of racing thoughts. So some people have described, like, I'm trying to go to sleep at night, but my thoughts just keep going and going and going. My brain doesn't shut off. That could be anxiety. Or even before we're going to do something new or exciting or different, such as a job interview or taking a test, we might have that sensation of racing thoughts. So this is many, many thoughts coming to us at once about a certain situation or even about multiple situations. People also describe these cognitive mental symptoms as uh, worry, fear, or even dread, just a sense of thinking that something terrible is about to happen. Others, especially if you deal with test anxiety, experiences these symptoms as confusion or mental block, almost like if you've ever had that sensation of, I just drew a blank. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to write. I couldn't remember what I was supposed to say. So. If we kind of look at all these symptoms together, there is something called a worry or panic cycle. And this is how we sort of put the connection between the clusters, our cognitive symptoms and our physiological symptoms. And this is, um, this is basically a nice summary of how anxiety can get out of hand for us when one or two of these symptoms shows up. So if we look at really a panic cycle here, we have an event, something happens, and it could be I drop my phone in the toilet or anywhere to a new person says hello to me. It doesn't matter. Just an event is anything that happens. If we interpret that event in terms of a worry, the way that we interpret things, as we're going to see later, really matters. It makes a big difference in how we view the world around us and how we experience the world around us. So if I drop my phone in the toilet and I say, oh, no, I don't have insurance on the phone, I can't afford a new phone, this is the worst thing in the world that can happen to me, I'm going to feel uncomfortable in my body. So I'm going to experience a physiological symptom. So let's say my stomach gets upset, which is another physiological symptom that's common with anxiety. Let's say my stomach gets upset, and now I'm worried about my stomach. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I might be sick. What's wrong with my stomach? There's something seriously wrong. Like, I, first I dropped my phone in the toilet. Now my stomach is really upset, and it just feels worse. Now I'm thinking worse things, and then that makes my physiological symptoms get more intense, even get worse. I might start to get new physiological symptoms, and then I start checking to see, like, am I breathing? Am I okay? Like, am I going to throw up? Is there any other symptoms that I'm having? Do I need to go to the hospital? What is going on? And before you know it, if we don't cut that off somewhere, we could end up in a full-blown panic attack. Any of us who have ever had a panic attack know how uncomfortable, not dangerous, but how uncomfortable that can be. So we're going to work on tonight about how to stop this cycle and also understanding the role of what to do when anxiety shows up and what not to do when anxiety shows up. Um, in treatment, when people come for cognitive behavior therapy for anxiety, this is if they've had panic attacks, this is one of the first things that we target because it is very effective because this is basically what triggers uh, many panic attacks is how we're interpreting certain events. Also, even if it was a benign event, such as somebody saying hello to you or just waking up in the morning, if we have a symptom and we're not quite sure why we feel a certain way, so let's say our heart is beating, we interpret it beating a little bit faster than usual, if you still misinterpret that as I'm having a heart attack or something's wrong with my heart, you could still go down the same path of having a full-blown panic attack. So anxiety is important. So we never, ever have the goal for anyone to eliminate anxiety. That would not be safe for them because that could put somebody in danger. The evolutionary purpose our, at our roots, our biological purpose here for anxiety is to keep us safe. Many of us probably remember when we were younger learning about the fight or flight response. This is basically when we are perceived to be in danger. So when our brain says, oh, my goodness, I'm in danger right now, we engage in this fight or flight response. So this is our body prepares us to either fight our way through a situation or we're going to run, we're going to get the heck out of there. We're going to run away as fast as we can. But either way, our body has to do some certain physiological changes in order for us to survive the danger. 
So as you see here in the slide, we, uh, we cover some of these. So our worries, it starts with our worry thoughts. We anticipate danger, and we get our body ready to confront danger. So let's say, like, the bear escapes from the, the local zoo and chooses you to run after you. You need to make a decision about that. You're not going to be thinking about the test that you have the next day or the fight that you had with your significant other. You're in survival mode at that time. So what happens? Your heart rate will increase and that blood will start pooling in your legs to make them eat stronger, even though they feel weak. So that's that, that sense of like, oh my goodness, that the weakness in our legs is because the blood is circulating in a different way that more intensely than it normally does. Your rate of breathing is likely to increase so you can get oxygen for quick, sudden movement. So that's why you're not going to have slow, deep breaths anymore. You're going to be breathing more shallow, quick breaths, just the same as if you were exercising, same sort of breathing. The blood supply to your brain decreases. You don't need to be problem-solving higher-order thinking skills at that time. You're in survival mode, so you might feel dizzy, might be confused, what's going on, unreal unreality, and it also makes your extremities cold. This fight-or-flight response also triggers sweating. So from an evolutionary perspective, it kind of makes your skin slippery so somebody can't grab you, and um, so it makes it a little bit easier for you to get away. And this is something that the digestion slowing, when, when I've told clients in the past, most people find very interesting about why my stomach gets so, so, so upset when I'm anxious, is because at the time that you're truly in danger, your body and your brain say, I don't need to worry about digesting food right now. That's not a priority biologically for me, for my survival. So your digestion slows down and sometimes even just shuts shuts off. So what happens is anything that's in there, like your stomach can get really, you might get nauseous, you get upset because there's nothing happening that should be happening normally. So that people might experience it as cramping or nausea. The most important thing to remember about these symptoms is that they are not harmful to us. They're not dangerous, but if we interpret them in a catastrophic way, they intensify the, our preparation for danger. So if we think that we're in danger, even when we're not, but if we think that we are, this is how our body is likely to react, to, to keep us safe, it's preservation. So that's why it's really important, and we'll learn tonight about how to accurately interpret our environment. Okay, so this um, is a metaphor. I wish I could claim it as my own, but I can't. It was from a graduate, when I was in graduate training, a uh, very um, inspiring and very difficult professor that I had shared this with our, our supervision group. Um, and so this is a picture of Chinese finger traps. And if you've ever played with them, what happens is, is when you put your fingers in, your natural reaction is to try to pull them out. But when you pull them out, it gets tighter and tighter around your fingers. You actually can't get out. The only way to get out of one of the finger traps is to push your fingers together. And this is the exact same principle with anxiety. If you want to get out of the anxiety, if you want to feel better and you want to actually get better from anxiety, you have to avoid the avoidance. When we're anxious, we tend to feel very uncomfortable. We want to shed that feeling. We don't want to feel that way anymore. So we're willing to do things, either escaping, like getting out of a situation, or not going to a particular situation because it triggers anxiety. But what happens is, is you feel better short term. So let's say you're in a crowded restaurant, you start to feel anxious, and you, feel, you think it's too much, I have to leave. You'll leave, you'll feel a little bit better on the outside, and you'll say, whew, good thing I avoided that dangerous, very bad situation, because now I feel better. I felt bad in there, it was bad, and now I feel better. But the next time you're invited to go to a restaurant or you have to go to a restaurant, it's going to be even harder because you, were re you reinforced the anxiety and you got stuck in this trap. So one of the best things that you can do when you feel anxious is to, one, accurately assess whether you're in danger or not, or not, and if you're not, to go for it. Avoid the avoidance and move towards the anxiety rather than away. Managing anxiety. There are so many tools and skills to use to manage anxiety. I'm only going to give you a few tonight. I'm going to give you a lot, but there's only a few of like really what, what's out there because, again, everybody gets anxious in their life. It, it's a normal emotion. So in treatment, one of the first things that we tend to cover is what's called psychoeducation. So we provide background knowledge about anxiety and what triggers it and why it can be helpful and why it can be unhelpful and what anxiety is, basically how to understand true danger, understanding avoidance, and how anxiety is reinforced. So 
as we've covered so far, anxiety is a normal human emotion. You will, there's no getting around it. You will be anxious at some point. Sometimes it might be more than other people. Sometimes it might be less than other people, but it's going to happen. And it's important to get good to develop a skill of, am I really in danger or do I just feel like this is scary? So let's say you're walking down a dark alley by yourself at 3 a.m. in like some inner city somewhere. You should feel anxious because that's a potentially dangerous situation. But if you're walking into a college class in daylight and there's like 20 people around you who are around your same age and you're meeting up, like you have a design, I mean, I'm sorry, a designated time, you might feel nervous and you could feel a little anxious because it's a new class, but you shouldn't have a fight or flight response at that time. That's an inappropriate, unhelpful time for anxiety to show up. If you understand avoidance, so just because we feel like that's scary to do, it's scary to ask somebody out. It's scary to go on a job interview. It's scary to buy a new house. It's scary to do a presentation. It's scary to go to a new restaurant. Just because it's scary doesn't mean it's bad. In fact, it might even be good to understand if I avoid this, it's going to make it into this big scary monster when it doesn't need to be, and I'm not going to be able to do it, and I'm just going to make my world smaller and smaller. So it's better to just go for it, like we said on the previous slide, and, and go in or go ask that person out, or ask that question, or go on that job interview, whatever it might be. Anxiety is very easily reinforced. You might not even realize that you're doing it. Parents often do this for, the, for their children, even if they're grown, where it's so tempting to rescue your child. They're anxious about, um, let's say, leaving, talking in class. So, so they talk for them, or they're anxious about meeting new friends, so they try to facilitate that for them, or they're anxious in the mall, so they say, let's just all, as a family, like, forget it, we'll just all leave because it's more uncomfortable to do it this way. So it's important for us to understand really how anxiety is reinforced. Continuing on with managing anxiety, there's lots of different coping skills that you can use. So one is deep breathing. We're going to cover deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, visualization, the way that we think, our cognitive thinking patterns, as well as mindfulness tonight. So the first, deep breathing. So the way that there's a big misconception with the way that people have thought about deep breathing. I'm hopeful that maybe some of you have learned the correct way to, to actually get a deep breath in. So if I said to you to take a deep breath and you do something, I know you can't see me, but if you do something that makes your shoulders kind of come up, like it's a whole body movement, that is um, a common misconception about what a deep breath is. But that's actually a shallow breath. A deep breath is, if you see the in the picture here where the woman has her hand kind of by her belly button, that's where you actually want the air to go. So you want to get the air down to your belly, so down to the bottom of your lungs. And it's going to obviously pass through your chest, so there's going to be some air that's going to go through there. So your chest is going to rise and fall, but your shoulders should stay relatively calm. And the only area that should really be moving will be that abdomen, your belly. And sometimes people, it's helpful to think of them as having a balloon in their belly. So when they take a deep breath in, they want to picture a balloon slowly filling with air. And when they breathe out, they can picture that balloon slowly deflating. Not a quick, like if you let go of a full balloon and it goes everywhere all over the room fast. That's not helpful either. So it's, it's a nice slow rhythm of air coming in and air going out. A lot of people find it helpful to even feel the temperature of the air that they're breathing in as it passes through their chest and as it goes through their belly and also feel the movement. So as in this picture, a lot of people that I've worked with in the past, we do this. We'll put our one hand on our chest and one hand by our belly buttons, and we'll feel just calmly our hands rhythmically moving as we're taking our deep breath in. Now the key with deep breathing here, if you looked it up, you're going to find, oh, breathe for this count, hold it for this count, exhale for that count, or do all this alternate breathing thing. It's really what works best for you. So what I usually recommend is if breathing in and you feel like you filled up your belly, then let it go when it feels correct to you. So you don't have to count to 
five because then you're going to end up just like making yourself more uncomfortable. Like maybe your breath is just going to be a little bit shorter than somebody somebody else. So you breathe, you find where's my comfort level here. I'm just going to breathe and I'm going to see how it feels. Also, what's helpful to remember with deep breathing is when we're really anxious, if we're breathing rapidly, it's not realistic to assume that we're going to go from quick, rapid breathing to nice, full breathing very quickly. So we take it down a notch. We take it down a notch. We just try to strive for, okay, I'm just going to slow my breath a little bit for a few breaths. And then when that feels comfortable, I'm going to try to do it again just to bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. And that's the correct way to do deep breathing. So, so no uh, whole body movements with, because that's actually shallow breathing. And you should hear the difference if you breathe shallow versus deep. Also, you can close your eyes. You can breathe through your nose. If your nose is not stuffy and it's clear, breathe through your nose. If it's stuffy, you have allergies or you're sick, don't worry. Then just breathe through your mouth. But breathe what feels comfortable for you where you feel that you can get your deepest cleansing breath in. Okay, progressive muscle relaxation. So there's many ways of doing progressive muscle relaxation. Basically, the principle here, when you practice this when you're calm, so you can either go from your head to your toes or from your toes to your head, and you isolate different muscle groups. And as you go through each muscle group, you kind of tense them, not to the point where they hurt. You're not actually initiating any sort of pain, introducing pain, but more like where it might shake a little bit, just enough where there's, there's tension, there's, there's visible and, and it's felt, physiological tension in that muscle group. And you hold it, usually for about seven seconds, and then once those seven seconds are up, you drop the tension. And the key here is to drop it quickly and completely, almost as if that muscle became a wet noodle, just like totally loosey-goosey, loose, loose muscle, not a quick, um, just like a drop down like it's lead and, and not a slow, I'm still holding on to some tension, sort of putting my arm back down or resting my legs on the floor. It should be a very quick, just let go of the tension. It takes a little practice at first to get good at it and to be comfortable with it, but it's very, um, very helpful and doable when you do practice it. So you isolate your muscle groups. You don't hurt yourself, and you're just working through. You could do the large muscles. You could even do – you could squint up, pretend like there was a fly that landed on your face and do all the tiny muscles in your face. You can find scripts. There's lots of scripts online if you Google progressive muscle relaxation or Jacobsonian muscle relaxation. Um, I did a, a mini sort of script on my, on my website too, which we'll talk about later. Um, but basically you can also just do it on your own. I usually recommend before, when, you're, when you're calm, when you're first learning it, do it when you're calm so you get the concept of what it feels like to tense and relax your muscles. Um, I've had people fall asleep when they've done a full 20-minute muscle relaxation because it is very relaxing. So some people like to do it before bed. It does help them to fall asleep. And the, the purpose of this is not only to serve you well when you're calm, but for you to really identify when you are anxious, your body tends to tense up. You have tense muscles. For those of us that live with a lot of anxiety, you might be in pain. You might have, say, my neck hurts a lot, my back hurts a lot. You're holding tension. So if you get a lot of practice with this, you'll say, when I'm anxious, oh, I feel that now. I feel in my body I'm holding tension. I'm tense. You'll be able to identify the difference between a tense muscle and a relaxed muscle. And without tensing it, you'll learn how to relax it and let go of the anxiety. And that's ultimately the goal with progressive muscle relaxation as a technique. Okay, so visualization is another very helpful coping scale. I put some pictures here just to kind of give you some examples of what visualization might look like and knowing that we all visualize different things and there is no right or wrong way to really do it. It's what feels good to us. So, so first we've got memory lane. So we've got thinking of a happy or a meaningful memory. And when you do this, you want to remember as many details as possible. Write down to what you were wearing, who you were with, what they were wearing, what was said, how you felt. See if you can smell the air in whatever memory it was. Uh, if it was eating, involving eating something or a taste in your mouth, see if you can kind of think and, and feel that taste again in your mouth. What were you hearing? Just basically going through all of your five senses and reliving that memory. That's a very calming exercise. You want to pick a happy memory, not, not a sad memory, uh, but a happy, calming, um, relaxing memory. 
Others might say, you know, rather than doing a personal memory, I just like really visualizing some sort of peaceful scene, some something in nature or some place that I've been before. Um, so if it's been, let's say, uh, a lake or the beach, we've got flowers here, we've got mountains. For me, uh, I love picturing a lake with mountains and, and, and remembering times when I, when I visited places like Lake George and, and being there and, and smelling the air and, and reliving that experience, for me, sort of combined the memory lane and the visualization. But you can also just create a new image in your mind. So some people will do this when they're calm. Sometimes people will do, will do this when they're very anxious to kind of take a break from a situation to calm their body a little bit and then to go back in. And these are just samples. For you, you might, it might be, um, you know, riding on a train or being in a car or cloud watching or, or snow. There's, there's no limit. It's really just what you find soothing and relaxing. Okay, so cognitive thinking patterns here. So we've got this, this dude here wearing his thinking cap. The way that we think about our experiences and our world matters. It makes a very big difference with how we feel. And this is not new information. There's many, many, many years of research that has confirmed this, that there's, um, there, was, there used to be this assumption, and many people still hold this assumption, that something happens, good or bad, right, just something, anything. Like we said earlier, I dropped my phone in the toilet, uh, I got a new pencil, somebody said hello to me, I got a phone call, whatever it might be, anything. Something happens and I feel something about it automatically. But there's a tiny space between the something happening and the way that we feel about that, and that's called the way that we interpret the situation. And the way that we interpret the situation matters so much that it actually it makes a difference with how we feel greatly. So I'm going to give you an example, which is um, one of the first examples that I was given when I was, when I was taught this concept in training. So let's say there's two students. They both take the same test. They both get the same grade. And let's say the grade is a C. Student A, so one student gets the C, and they say, I'm such a loser. I can't believe I got a C on this test. Now I'm not going to probably pass the class. My parents are going to kill me. I'm going to fail out of college. This sucks. I, I'm a horrible student. They're going to feel not well at all. They're going to feel maybe angry. They're going to feel sad. They might be upset. They're just not going to be very happy with themselves. They're going to be really upset about that. Now, let's say student B also gets the C, and instead they say, okay, I got a C. It's not the grade that I was hoping for, but next time I won't go out with my friends the night before the test. I will change the way that I study. I think maybe I should do those index cards that I didn't do this time around. And hopefully I'll do better. It's not the best, but it's not the end of the world. They might still be disappointed in getting the C, but they're, they have a plan moving forward, and they're not going to feel nearly as upset or unproductive or as negative as student A. So if we always remember that the way that we think about things matters the way that we feel, it's the same that's true for anxiety. So if we think about something and we say, oh my gosh, this is awful that I have to make this phone call right now, or this is horrible that I have to take this test right now, or I can't believe you know, the, the waitress is asking for my order and I can't remember what I, what I want. This is like the end of the world here. You're going to feel a lot more anxious than if you just said, okay, it might be uncomfortable. I believe that I can handle it, and ultimately it's the best for me to stick, stick it out and work through it. Mindfulness. So we don't have a lot of time to cover all what mindfulness can really offer, but it's gaining much, much more popularity, and again, it's not a new concept. It's a little bit newer in the application to psychology, but still not, not a very, very new concept. So mindfulness is basically the principle of being fully present in our situation in our environment, whether it's comfortable or not. So the goal here is not to alleviate discomfort. It's to experience the discomfort and not run away from it or panic because we're uncomfortable. And also to embrace happy times too. That's basically, it's whatever we're experiencing at that time, we are allowing our body, we are accepting it. We're not trying to argue with it. We're not trying to fight with it. We're not trying to end it. We're just sort of accepting it. So this little illustration here, we've got a parent and a child, 
And if you look in their thought bubbles here, uh, mom or dad has a lot of different things they're thinking about at this time. You know, it might be, you know, work. It might be toys. It might, you know, what they have to do the next day. It might be how to make dinner. It might be problems. Just like a lot of stuff. So their mind is full, not mindful. Their mind is full of other things. And it's not quite a lot of what they're actually doing at that time. They're distracted. They're pulled from the situation. Whereas the little girl, in her thought bubble, she's fully present. What she sees is what she sees. What she's thinking about is what she's seeing. And she's probably having a better time because she's fully there and she's not consumed by what is um, happening later on or what has happened in the past. A lot of times when we're anxious, we're not living in the moment. We're actually outside of the moment because we're anxious about something that has happened in the past or might happen in the future not always what's happening right now. Sometimes we are, but that's generally fear. So if we can work on being more mindful and just accepting, okay, right now I feel anxiety. Anxiety has shown up, but it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It doesn't mean that it won't end. It just means I feel really uncomfortable right now, and I'm going to practice being mindful and embracing the feeling and knowing that it's a normal feeling to have. Okay, so making anxiety work for you, because, again, we're not going to ever set up the goal for us to not be anxious. So we have to understand the role of anxiety in our life. When is it likely to show up? When is it not likely to show up? When am I most able to manage it and deal with it? When am I least likely able to manage it and deal with it? It's important for us to assess normal levels of anxiety versus an anxiety disorder. We're going to cover anxiety disorders just briefly in a moment. Um, but again, while anxiety is a normal human emotion, if you feel that it impairs your functioning where it's hard for you to really go many places or you endure them with intense discomfort or you find that it's your, your world is getting tinier and tinier and, tinier and smaller and smaller because you can't do certain things, um, then it might be time to seek uh, the support of a professional who can kind of help guide you there to see if you meet criteria for an anxiety disorder and point you in the right direction for treatment. It's important to utilize appropriate coping skills. All the coping skills that we've learned tonight, you can put into practice right away. You know, there's no magic to them. Uh, there's no special secret. It's just things that have been shown to work with dealing with anxiety. It is important, please seek support. If you're in this webinar because you feel like you feel anxious a lot of the time, you can't manage it, it's really difficult, um, seek, there's so much support that's available for you. Anxiety is very common. Uh, anxiety disorders are pretty common too. So there's, there's lots of support available to help you. What's really good is to focus on growing be vulnerable. We can't, we can't grow as an individual unless we put ourselves in vulnerable situations, meaning we have to take risks. We have to move towards the things that are scary. Um, we have to move towards change rather than away. And if you think about times in your life when you're really nervous to do something but you did it anyway, how good it feels when it's done. Even if it's just riding a roller coaster or applying for a job and, and you don't even get the job, it's just like, wow, I did that. I took that risk. And that was good. I feel like I've grown as an individual. Uh, also, listen to feedback from your body. You might be very anxious where you do feel very nauseous. You do feel like you're going to faint. It doesn't mean you will. You might, but it doesn't mean that you will. Um, so listen to your feedback from your body. If you need to take a break in a situation to kind of calm down physiologically, take the break, but always go back. Don't leave. Don't leave the situation because you'll just reinforce your anxiety. So listen to feedback from your body to help you assess, okay, I'm just feeling uncomfortable right now. The other key with anxiety is if you do, with, with true anxiety, if you do nothing, you don't use any coping skill whatsoever, it will go away because our bodies are not designed to be at a high state of anxiety for a very long period of time. So if you use a coping scale, it'll go away quicker, but just knowing that eventually it's going to end. It's not a permanent feeling. Um, no feeling is really permanent. So it's not a permanent feeling or a permanent situation. So listen to feedback from your body. Okay, so there are many, many different types of anxiety disorders. So, so here's a listing of, of, of most of them, not all of them, but most of them here. Um, and there's different criteria for each one. You don't need to worry um, about, about that or knowing the criteria, but because a professional would help evaluate this 
for you. But we have from people that have panic disorder uh, to just have worries all the time and generalized anxiety disorder, OCD, separation anxiety disorder, selective mutism, specific phobia. So that's where somebody has a like a particular fear in one area. So let's say it's spiders or uh, talking in public, and it's only it only seems to be that. That's like a huge thing. That's what a specific phobia is. A social anxiety disorder, agoraphobia. Um, and then we also have anxiety that's induced from, uh, you know, some sort of substance or medication. Do not try to diagnose yourself. Do not try to Google these and try to look up all the symptoms. Seek professional help if you feel like, hmm, I'm not really sure if I'm experiencing normal levels of anxiety and it's really starting to impact my life and my relationships and my family and my work or, or, any, or a couple of those. And the professional, um, such as a psychologist, can help you with that. Okay, so here's some helpful resources. If you are going to look stuff up, because anxiety will tend to lead people to like, I just have to look up stuff, and not everything is a reputable resource here. But uh, here are some for you. Um, the first is a great workbook that you can use uh, for, we, I've used it in therapy with clients before, but you can also use it on your own. That really kind of covers a lot of cognitive behavior therapy principles. Um, and then we have a few uh, associations here that have great websites and resources and education. These are, you know, you could trust them. Uh, resources for both professionals and the public, so there are good resources there. Um, on my website where it says Understanding Anxiety, I have some just brief little um, recordings that I made just to give you some background about understanding anxiety. Some of it's similar to what we covered tonight. Some of it's just a little bit more in depth. And then if you do feel like you could use some support or you need some help, I put some two links here. One is local uh, from the Suffolk County Psychological Association. So um, as we mentioned earlier, I'm on the board and I'm chairperson of the website, so I can assure you this is a very up-to-date database. So what we have here is a link. If you click on it, it, and it brings you to a search engine for psychologists if you're local in Suffolk County. Um, and you could search by your insurance and what you're looking for help with, uh, your age group, uh, what type of uh, orientation, therapy orientation you're looking for. You could be very specific or more general, and it will come up with psychologists for you. Nationally, this is, uh, a, a, again, a similar, I'm thinking pretty accurate and up to date through the APA, the American Psychological Association. They also have a database where you can find a psychologist. So you can use either one of those if that's outside nationally, if it's outside of Suffolk County, um, and it'll help, f help you find the support of a psychologist. So about me, if you want help um, in in terms of finding a referral or you might be interested in, in working with me, feel free to, you know, go to my website or, or give me a call. I always love chatting with, uh, with some new people and seeing how I might be able to help. Um, and it would be really uh, exciting if you have an idea of visiting the website and seeing if it's helpful to you. So for me, in my practice, I really love working with anxiety. I treat it often. It's the main focus. I other areas too, but it's the same focus. I've dealt with anxiety in my life as well. So I sometimes empathy is way turned up. If you come in with with anxiety, and I think it would be uh, helpful um, to chat, or I can give you a resource, any any of these resources. So you can contact me, or you can contact uh, and you, using any of the resources that I had provided you. And uh, thank you so much for coming. I'll take any questions. Taryn, I'm sure you'll help me field the questions if there are any. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Shake Harmon. We really appreciate your time, and not only your time and your expertise, but helping us with real, meaningful, tangible tools that, like you said, the average, regular, everyday person with no, you know, particular skill set and anxiety, you know, managing anxiety could be able to, to manage. So while you're thinking about some questions, if you have any, uh, we actually have one uh, from social media. It says, why do you think there is so much stigma around anxiety if so many people struggle with it? Way. Well, that's that's a great that's, question. That's a great question. Um, um, so, so with so, the stigma, so with I, think the stigma I think there's generally, generally stigma, stigma on mental, mental health, health 
in general, in general, not just not nicely, just nicely, nicely sides, but, but I can find that people that are becoming gradually people are gradually more accepting, accepting of, of anxiety, of anxiety but it's but really, it's a, it's really a cultural thing, so we're able to, as a culture, 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 it's really how it's presented. So if there's news stories about anxiety that are presented in an inaccurate way or an unhelpful way, that could increase the stigma and sort of maintain it. Um, and it's hard because it does take systemic change like that. Changing stigma takes a long time. So it's our hope as mental health professionals that we can kind of get the word out there that, hey, you know what, it's really not a big deal. I mean, 90% of my, probably even 95% of my practice now, which is a small practice, is anxiety, and that's just me. I mean, think about how many, there's many mental health professionals that are also treating anxiety, and, I, and even people that are still looking for help that, that, that don't ask for it. So ask for it because, hey, you might be able to embrace life in a much different way than you have been had if, if you get the help that you need. Laura, another question. Uh, can a new change in your everyday routine cause anxiety to oh, let's see, got caught up. can a new change in your everyday routine cause anxiety to I guess get to a level that puts yourself in danger? Um, I might need more clarification with putting yourself in danger. Putting yourself in danger, danger. Yourself in danger yourself like true danger, true meaning like, danger, like if you start if you I don't know, going don't by, know, yourself going by yourself in the middle of the night to a place that you don't know, or, or, or talking to talking people to, oh, that seem a little creepy, a little or, creepy or strangers, or getting in a car with somebody that's driving like, drunk. Like, 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 I don't know, I like, don't know like, exactly. Maybe exactly this is a little bit more, more, more as far as what you're doing by changing your daily routine. I think I think if I'm I, I think if I'm reading the question right, I think it's I think the person might be saying, can a new change in your everyday routine cause anxiety to a level that puts yourself in danger? So I think you were suggesting, you know, taking a risk, putting yourself out there in terms of new challenges. Is there ever anything I guess that maybe somebody could do that could be too far out of their comfort zone? And if there is, how do you know that? Oh, well, that's, yeah. Oh, okay. that's well, thank you for elaborating that. So, I mean, so, I mean it's, it's similar it's then. So, similar. if you want to take, we're talking stepping out of your comfort zone, like, hey, there's somebody that you're interested in dating, and you want to talk to them, and you, you wouldn't otherwise do that. You assess the danger beforehand, like, what's my risk here? The risk is they could say no, and then, all right. They said no, and maybe I'll feel X, Y, Z about that situation. If if it's more like, hey, I'm not sure if I could, I should drink five drinks and go to the comfort zone by driving with the car, then we would say, then that would be that, that's a little far, and that's not something we recommend. Anytime we do um, exposure work, meaning we're stepping out of our comfort zone, we're doing something we didn't, we wouldn't normally do, so we change our routine we do things that we would have been avoiding, we never actually put anybody in true danger because that's not the goal. Uh, that the, then you, you should feel anxious. We don't want you to be in a dangerous situation and not feel anxious because then we've reversed the purpose of the anxiety. It's more like stepping out of your comfort zone. Um, you could go pretty far. It's, in fact, it's good to step out of your comfort zone because that's how you grow. So if you picture like when kids learn to read, generally teachers will give them books that are just above the level where they're at. So it's, like it's still within their skill set at that time to grasp it. So it's not doing too quickly and it's not too difficult for them. And it's still you know, safe, if you will, as far as anxiety goes. Um, but we're not saying, hey, like, jump out of an airplane. I mean, maybe. Maybe you want to do that. <laughs> um, and, and even so, and that's a little bit more dangerous. That's definitely daredevil -y, but you would do it with an instructor and who's trained. And So, no, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that it's likely that you can end up in that unless you have this passion to try to put yourself in dangerous situations for some reason. Does that answer the question? Answer I the hope question it does, however, whoever asked it. Please feel free if you if you have more thoughts on that or if other questions come up. And here's another question. What is situational anxiety? What is, okay, so situational anxiety. I mean, it's, there's not like a formal diagnosis that says I have situational anxiety. But it's basically a descriptive term to say, okay, I feel anxious 
in this in these types of situations. So I feel anxious when I'm in a social situation, or I feel anxious when I have to talk about myself, or I feel anxious when I'm driving. Like it's just like in a particular situation, I've noticed a pattern where I feel I feel anxious in this situation. So then we kind of look at that and we say, well, what is it about that situation? Um, and how are you interpreting that situation? So I'll use an example. So let's say you notice that situationally when you're in a restaurant and you have to order food, that triggers anxiety. So say, are there other times outside of a restaurant where you also feel anxiety in a social situation? So is it just ordering food to a stranger and that concept of asking for what you want? Is it is it that? Or is there a sense of what might they think of me? Are they thinking anything about me? Am I going to remember what I want to order? Am I going to mess up what I what I say? Um, and knowing that, okay. And by the way, some exposures for that, what we've done in the past is have somebody mess up on purpose. I've changed their order three times. Like endure maybe possible negative judgment from somebody in a, in a certain situation. And again, that's going to step out of your comfort zone, not danger. You're just going to, we say sometimes we're going to have a little fun with this. We're going to test the water a little bit. And what's the worst that's going to happen? I mean, I'm sure somebody could blow up and it could end up in a dangerous situation. Uh, but most of the time that doesn't happen. The key here is that you're testing out the situation. So you're testing out whether or not our fear, our feared outcome is actually going to come true. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. And sometimes we deal with it much better than we thought. So, if that answers the question, I know I went above and a little bit beyond what it is, but it is. the best way to handle that is we test the waters a little bit and we change the situation around, step out of the comfort zone, and see what happens. Great. Thank you so much for that question. Sure, sure. Uh, sure, sure. And here's, a, here's another question. Uh, this one is actually about medication. Is medication ever involved in treating anxiety, or can you only seek counseling for help with anxiety? No, you can do either. So you can do either or. So there are many people that will just choose to do therapy, and that can be very effective. The newer research with cognitive behavior therapy, by the way, shows that it can change the brain when done, when participated in, um, and and doing the skills can change your brain and mimic the effects of some medications. Uh, so that's newer research now is very helpful and helpful for cognitive behavior therapy in particular. Um, so some people choose to say, I'm just going to target this with therapy, and and that is just what they need. It's they they learn the skills that they can apply in the future and currently. So that's a big benefit of therapy is that you're actually learning skills that to apply and to do things to deal with the anxiety. With medication, there are others that choose to just do medication alone, um, and that can help alleviate a lot of anxiety too, and that would be prescribed by a medical provider. I usually recommend to go to either a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner, somebody that has the training and that's their area of specialty rather than just your primary care provider. Um, a primary care might be comfortable prescribing a medication for a mental health concern, uh, but sometimes it's it's not always, uh, some clients have described it as like they didn't feel like it was the most accurate or that they had enough of the, the knowledge in that particular area to really make a good uh, informed decision. So some people will choose to just do medication on their own as well, and that can be effective too. Generally, though, if the anxiety is severe enough to warrant the use of medicine, we recommend that you would do a combination, and that's going to probably be the most effective. So in that way, the medication, and I've seen this in some clients, it, the medication helps them feel better enough to give them basically uh, the ability to participate and access skills in the cognitive behavior therapy treatment that they wouldn't have been able to without the medicine. So some people are very, very anxious where the idea of stepping out of their comfort zone even a little bit is so overwhelming to them. So they will opt to work with a provider to take some medicine to alleviate the anxiety so that they can do the work and then get the benefit from, from both. So really, um, it does depend on the individual, and whichever help that you seek first, that provider can help navigate working with a referral. So if you see a psychologist, and together you discuss the need for maybe medication could be helpful or is needed, they can help you find a referral, and you could talk about that in therapy. Or if you decide to seek the support for medicine first, 
you can talk with the medical provider and discuss the option of adding on therapy, what they feel based on based on your situation, and they can help you with a referral as well. Um, I do want to say I do recommend people not to just write off therapy right away and to say, oh, let me just take some medicine um, because therapy can be really helpful. And similarly, not just say, nope, I'm not going to do medicine for this uh, because we think, like, you know, if you had diabetes, like, would you not take the, the medicine that, that you need? It's like, if, if you need it and it could be really beneficial for you, it's, a, it's an important decision. And don't let anybody make it for you. It's an important decision, so ask lots of questions, talk it out, and be really informed about the risks, the benefits, side effects, um, and, and a commitment that you're making so you can make the best informed decision for you. All right, Dr. Vinci, Carmen, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this topic is, is really, like you said, it's extremely pervasive. A lot of people can relate to it. We just want to mention, for those of you who may have logged in a little later, this webinar is going to be recorded. We will post this on our alumni video vault if you'd like to check it out again. If maybe you didn't get a chance to write down those resources, we will have it available for you. We'll also be sending you shortly after the conclusion of this webinar a survey. We'd appreciate you filling out your honest thoughts and feedback so we can share them with our team to make the webinar experience even better all the time. Thank you so much, Laura. We really appreciate your time and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.